focus stacking. After my macro tool comparison video, I got so many requests regarding focus stacking that it was about time to do a video about focus stacking. My name is Wolf Amri, Wolf that I'm on Instagram and now also on Vero. Welcome to focus stacking galore. In my macro comparison video, I used a manual macro focusing rail to focus stack the images of the spider. This made me think of even better options, namely automating the process of focus stacking rather than using a wobbly manual slider. Now, why would you want to use a slider for focus stacking in general? Some mirrorless cameras have a built-in focus bracketing option. Well, first and foremost, not all cameras have that. Sony's don't have that in camera. Thank you, Sony. Nor do DSLRs. Second, Focus stacking in camera obviously only works for autofocus lenses. Macro lenses that will give you a higher magnification, like 2 to 1 or more, are manual focus lenses. So the in-camera focus stacking wouldn't work anyway. And third, as you will see in a few minutes, the slider gives you much more control over where you start and end the stack, and how big the steps actually are in real numbers. Having said that, in-camera focus stacking is much more convenient no doubt about that, but it is very limited. So I searched for an automated slider and found my friend Jens video on the Myop Slider Plus. Being a filmmaker, I found this solution extremely attractive because it means I can also use it for other stuff. What is incredible is that the Myop Slider Plus lets you set increments of 1.141 micrometer. That is roughly 1 1,000th of a millimeter. For my imperial friends, here is a size comparison, millimeter versus inch. And the Myop Slider Plus will let you set the distance from shot to shot to one one thousandth of this part here. Let me quickly show you how extremely little that is. First shot and the second shot after traveling 1.141 micrometer. You don't see any difference? Me neither. What about letting it travel 100 increments? Still not really visible. Compare that to one full rotation of the manual Nisi macro rail. That's roughly 2 mm, so 2000 times as much. That may sound pretty extreme, but you will soon realize that it isn't all that extreme. Let me show you what focus stacking is all about. If you watch this video, you are probably a macro photographer, so it is new to you that the higher the magnification you get of an object, the more shallow the depth of focus will become. And raising the aperture number too much means that you will introduce blur due to diffraction while still not getting everything in focus. Here is another example shot at f4 versus f16. This is where focus stacking comes into play. With the help of the Myop Slider Plus, you can shoot many images of different distances to the subject, giving you different focus with each shot. Then you can stack all these images together using a dedicated software. That's one use of focus stacking. The second one is just as cool. Let's say you want to photograph a product. I will use this Olympus camera that I tested. If I shoot it wide open, the camera will not be in full focus front to back. Stopping down would do the trick, but that's a bit boring compared to what I have in mind. What if I shoot wide open and focus stack the images? That would give me the wow factor I'm looking for. Pretty amazing. Look at the before and the after. And there is one more use for focus stacking. Lenscape photography. What if you want to use the sharpest aperture of your lens, but you have a foreground subject that you still want to get sharp? Without focus stacking, that's impossible. But for the rest of this video, I will focus on macro photography. And I want to add a second dimension to the video to make it even more useful. A very popular subject for macro photography in general are insects, particularly bees. Unfortunately, every day I go out, I see the one or the other bee under our lavender bushes cramping because of poison. It makes me incredibly sad and angry how we humans can thoughtlessly kill animals like bees and other insects that serve us so well. Many people don't even know that insects are providing most of our food by pollinating plants. Without them, we will get into massive trouble. So particularly if you're a photographer, avoid poison wherever you can and rather enjoy the diversity of insects. 
Besides that, stand up for our little friends and tell your opinion leaders that it's neither clever nor particularly nice to use poison that will harm so many species. So, I gathered all these dead bees to pay respect to them and create awareness with this video. They are the subject of interest for my shots with the slider. I placed them on different backgrounds and lit them with a lightweight and collapsible Godox FL150S LED light. You could of course also use a flash, but since I'm doing video, continuous light will serve me better. A possible flash setup could look like this, but a bigger softbox would help keep the contrast down. In regard to camera settings, you want to set everything manually. Otherwise, the camera will change exposure and, of course, focus during the shot, which is definitely not what you want. Also, turn off the camera stabilizer if you have one. The exposure settings, of course, depend on the amount of light you have available. First, you want to set the gain to the base level for the least amount of noise. That is usually ISO 100. Now for the most important camera setting for focus stacking, the aperture. Most people will tell you, choose the aperture that creates the sharpest image. Well, yes and no. First the yes. We don't really need to talk about that again. We already compared the single bumblebee image. But let's have a look at the half-finished stack shot at f4 versus f16. Let's zoom into 100% and again f4 versus f16. Diffraction kills sharpness and that is usually a no-go. But you also see a few advantages of the f16 shot in the areas of the hair, here and there. And also how the tentacles were rendered. That also depends on the focus stacking software though, and you can edit that out. We will later work on the image to get this result. But for insect photography, yes, you usually want to use the sharpest aperture of your lens to take the shot. But let me show you another example. This sundew was shot with the same lens, this time a 2.5 by magnification to show a bit more of the plant. Look at the raw stacking result at f2.8 versus f11 or even f16. Again, f28, f11, f16. The f28 is clearly sharper, but it has that ugly halo around some of the tentacles, while the f16 shot looks almost usable as is. Why is that? The sundew has a lot of tentacles that overlap in different layers. Let me explain by having a closer look at this area here that is particularly messy in the unedited output image. We have three tentacles that overlap. One, two, three. Or maybe even four. What we actually want is a final stack with a black background, just as we shot it. But look, tentacle one doesn't have a black background when it is sharp. Reason being is that the low F number blurs the out of focus tentacles so much that they overlap the black background. Tentacle 2 doesn't either, nor do tentacle 3 or 4. In fact, at F28 there is never a really black background in that particular area. So where is the stacking software supposed to take it from? And now let's have a look at the same area at F11. Tentacle 1, 2, 3 and 4. Let's compare tentacle 3 at f2.8 to tentacle 3 at f11. It's still not perfect, but due to the higher depth of focus, the out-of-focus tentacles show a lot less blur with it at least a partly black background and therefore allow for a much better stacking compared to the f2.8 shot. It's not perfect, but you can much easier make it perfect by editing. It's basically a lost case with the f2.8 shot though, unless you clone one of the other tentacles in Photoshop. Which means that the sharpest aperture on your lens isn't automatically the best setting for focus stacking. It usually is, but there are exceptions, being overlapping areas that are particularly brighter or darker than the background. Again, here is another finished stack to motivate you to keep watching. So what does that mean for our aperture setting? While you want to avoid that halo, you also want the maximum sharpness. And that's the problem. You cannot have both. So what aperture you set depends on the subject. For one-to-one -one macro and below, the halo isn't much of a problem in general, but with higher magnification, it is. 
For our first stack with the bees, I will use my Sony 90mm macro lens. The magnification isn't all that big and therefore I will set the aperture to f11. So much for aperture. That leaves us with shutter speed. If you, unlike me, are using flash, you don't have to bother about shutter speed and set it to 1 200th of a second for most cameras. As I said, I will use continuous lights and I set the shutter speed so that the image is well exposed. One more note regarding continuous lights. Particularly cheaper lights tend to flicker. If you can set a rather slow shutter speed, like one quarter of a second or even slower, that will even out the flicker and avoid getting shots with different brightness levels. For lights without power control, that's not possible. But for those with, you can reduce the light output to be able to shoot at lower shutter speeds. And while we are at camera settings, before we start, set the camera to silent mode if you have a mirrorless camera. That has the advantage that it doesn't count against shutter actuations and wear down the shutter. When shooting many stacks with lots of images, that quickly adds up. Now to the MyUp Slider Plus. It comes with a 1 quarter inch thread that you want your tripod head on. Or, like I do, I mount my heavy tripod below and use a quick-release plate with adapter by PGY Tech. I replaced all my quick-release plates with these because they are so tiny and lightweight. What is important is that the camera is parallel to the slider. If it is not, you get problems with the parallax effect. So if you use a ball head, don't point it down. What you will also need and can order with the slider is a cable to control the camera. What you need to control the slider is the MyOps app. There are two different ones available from MyOps. I will use this one. Once I'm connected, I go to Focus Stacking and then I can start the settings. First, I click here to set the start and end point. That can be a bit confusing because since it's also a camera slider for video, it says left and right here, while you are actually moving forwards or backwards. I recommend mounting the camera so that it faces the right when you look at it from the side where the logo is printed. If you then stand on the side, right on the app will also be right. Personally, I'd set point B first and I'd make this the point of the far end. Let me show you why. It happened more than once that I set point E first, then for setting point B, the slider will travel to the point where B was set last and guess what happens? Nope, not what you want. So, set the furthest point first. I reached out to my apps to give them my feedback and they said they're going to address that issue in a future firmware update. Either way, setting the furthest point first has another reason. Your subject will be biggest in your frame because you're closest to the subject. Therefore, composing your shot for the farthest point you want in focus, make sure you don't cut off anything that you actually want in your frame leave a bit of leeway to be on the safe side. Okay, how do you actually set the point? You can do that by dragging the slider carefully left or right until the furthest point of the subject that you want to be in focus is in focus. And now I'd recommend to go even a bit further so that the furthest point of the subject is actually out of focus. That way you are on the safe side and there will be no bad surprise just because you missed the spot by half a millimeter. I'm currently using the beta app and up here are choices for making this slider here more sensitive. At least that is what I think. But for me it doesn't change anything. It would surely be super convenient and is a great idea, but I'm probably too early. Once I'm done, I confirm point B with the check mark here. Then you choose point A down here. The slider will move to the point A that you used last time. And once it arrived there, you can move it to your new start point. Just like with the end point that you want in focus, leave a bit of leeway with a start point. You can easily delete excessive images afterwards. That was the points. Let's exit out of here by clicking the arrow top left. Next up is the movement per frame, or in other words, the distance the slider travels between every shot. MyOps doesn't list the distance the slider travels, but rather the multiple of the smallest possible distance. As I already said, that smallest possible distance is roughly 1 micron. So if you enter 500 steps here, the travel distance from one shot to the next will be 500 times 1.142 micron, which is 
a little more than half a millimeter. Now choose wisely here. You can of course later select less images than you shot for the software stacking, but in general you want the least amount of images that still give you a perfect stack. Why is that? Most of you will probably think it's because of the amount of data that you get with too many images. That's a point, but that's not the most important point. Your second thought is probably that it will take longer to stack when you have more files. That is also true, but still not that important. What is really important is editing. When we later fine-tune the stack, you would have to wade through tons of useless images to find the one that you want to use to correct a specific area. If you only have the amount you really need, you will be much faster finding the right picture. Talking about being faster. One thing you need to consider, from an artistic point of view, stacking images so that the complete subject is in focus might not give you the best image. Personally, I actually prefer to only focus stack and therefore sharpen a part of a subject, except for a product shot, of course. Let's, for the fun of it, compare a full stack to a partial stack and a single shot. Pretty cool, right? If you're like me, a partial stack would save you hundreds of shots and lots of time. You can, of course, take all the images and later decide to use less of them for your stack. All up to you. But back to the steps. What you also don't want is too few shots. Setting the travel distance between every shot too big will give you a bad stacking result with blurred lines across your subject, because you don't have enough sharp images to cover every part of the subject. And talking about the amount of images, let me get back to aperture. A higher aperture obviously also needs less images, because you have a higher depth of focus to begin with. I know that sounds super confusing, but I have good news for you. I have created a cheat sheet for focus stacking. I'll give you the link to that focus stacking cheat sheet at the end of the video. I have done tons of stacks with different aperture settings and different magnifications and tested them with different steps. After that, I even found an online calculator that basically confirmed my results. I will also link you to that at the end of the video. But a cheat sheet surely is more practical because it is faster to use. But back to the Myops Slider Plus and our dead bees. For this shot, I won't need very small steps, because it is not a real macro. So 800 is enough. You don't have to confirm the setting for the steps. I assume you, like me, have an urge to click on the check mark here, like you did for confirming point A and B. But that would start the focus bracketing process. Better would be having a start button here. The Myops app now tells you how many frames it will take for your stack to travel from point A to point B. Make sure you have enough room on your SD card for that stack. You might get frustrated otherwise. Okay, next setting in the Myops app is exposure. Here you enter the exposure time. For those of you who don't know, exposure time is actually shutter speed. Or better said, shutter speed is actually exposure time. There is no such thing as shutter speed. If you think there is, maybe check out my website exposuretriangle.com. That will give you a better understanding about exposure in general. Promise. Why do we need this setting? It doesn't actually remotely set the shutter speed on the camera, but it tells the slider when the shot is over and it can safely move to the next point. If it starts moving too early, when the camera still takes the image, you can forget your complete stack. Let me show you why. When you're that close, every tiny camera movement will introduce camera shake. So if the slider moves before the shot is over, you will end up with a blurry shot. So the exposure time that you set here just has to be as long or longer than your real exposure time. Here it is given in decimal numbers with commas rather than fractions that we photographers are used to. I have given them some feedback in this regard, maybe they will change it at one time. The way it is now, you have to calculate. 0 0.5 would be half a second, 0 0.2 would be one fifth of a second, and so on. However, you don't have to be too exact here. If you are below one second and you want to save you the calculations, just go with one second. Rounding up to the next full second makes things a bit easier. And camera shake is also the reason for the last setting. The interval. After a shot, the slider has to travel to the spot for the next shot. And that again introduces shake. 
Depending on how sturdy your tripod and your camera mount on top of the myops are, it may take a while for the vibration to settle. The time span that you're supposed to set on the interval is the time it takes for the camera to stop shaking. I usually set 3 seconds. That will of course extend the time the whole stack takes, but I want to be on the safe side. Before we start, don't forget to connect the camera with the cable, and then click the check mark at the bottom right to start the image taking process. Now the app will show you graphical representations of the interval and the exposure, how much the slider moved from point A to point B, and the total distance it travels, the elapsed time and the remaining time, and finally the image is shot and the image is total. So I let the camera travel the distance to complete the shot. That was pretty amazing. Hands-free focus bracketing. By the way, what we did so far was focus bracketing. Now we're going to do focus stacking as we're going to stack the images into one file. Before that, the MyUp Slider Plus definitely gets my recommendation. And as I said, beside that, it acts as a regular slider with different functions like time lapse, etc. But back to focus stacking. Once I'm finished, I'll input the images into Lightroom. I usually do that by putting every stack into a separate folder where I note the slider steps, the aperture used, and the magnification I set on my lens. In case it is a manual exposure lens, it might not record that info. That way I can learn on the way in case something is not perfect. Then I give the shots a quick edit and export them as 8-bit TIFF with LZW compression, which is a lossless compression algorithm. Color space, Provote RGB. I did a lot of testing. 16-bit didn't give me any advantage in regard to the results. They took longer to render and particularly took twice as long in the editing process, which was quite annoying. I'll explain that when we get there. The LZW compression adds some speed to the editing process too. That's why I recommend it. JPEG would add a bit of bending here and there, so I definitely go with TIFF. Once the images are exported, I bring them into the stacking app. I'll show you the workflow and the results for different stacking programs. My favorite since a few weeks is Serene Stacker. Before that, it was Helicon Focus. Both are dedicated focus programs. But before we will dive into these, let me show you the process in Photoshop, because that is what most of you have available. First, I load my export into layers in Photoshop. I could do that right out of Lightroom by selecting all the images I want to stack and then right-click, edit in, open as layers in Photoshop. But since I need the images in the other apps too, let me work with the exported ones. To open all images as layers in a single Photoshop document, I go to File, Scripts, Load Files into Stack. Then I select Use Folder here browse to find a folder and hit OK. Down here I would check attempt to automatically align source images. Remember I told you in the last image the camera was much closer to the subject than in the first image. And being closer your subject is logically bigger in the frame. That needs to be corrected. And now I would normally wait. No, I won't let you wait. Loading and aligning takes three and a half minutes and we didn't even stack yet. That's the next step. Before that, another note. If you try to save this stack of 68 images as a layered PSD file, you'd run into an error. It would exceed the 2 GB limit. So you'd have to save it as a large document format PSB file. It has a file size of 2.9 GB. And with a 16-bit TIFF, it would even be 6 GB. Not only would that take a pretty powerful computer, it also fills up your hard drive pretty quick. Ok, let's continue the focus stacking process. In the Layers panel, select the last and then shift click and select the first image. Then go to Edit, Auto Blend Layers and in the dialog box choose Stack Images and also check the boxes for seamless tones and colors and content aware fill transparent areas. And then I hit OK and wait again. No, we're not gonna wait. I'll tell you that was another 5 minutes. Altogether, that was 8.5 minutes for 68 images. The more images you have, the more time it will take. Anyway, we have a result. 
it's actually pretty decent. Photoshop doesn't always stack that well. But we see a few problematic areas that would need some retouching. But to edit these errors is really cumbersome in Photoshop. I would have to manually find the layer by individually soloing one layer after the other by alt clicking the layer visibility icon. In this case, the problematic area is distributed across four or more layers. I would first have to mask the area out. Then find the layer where this area is sharp by disabling one layer mask after the other by shift clicking the layer mask. Then mask it in, then go back to the blurred layers to find the others. It's a mess. And this is a comparatively good and easy stack. Others look much worse. And this is why I want to introduce you to dedicated stacking programs. First is Helicon Focus. Its clear strength is speed. Let me quickly import my images into the program and hit render to get my first result. In the background, you see the process. There are three different stacking algorithms that create different results. Almost everyone recommends trying them all for each stack. Why? Because it is super fast. We're already finished. It took 27 seconds. Remember the 8 minute 30 from Photoshop? That's 20 times as much. Let's zoom in a bit. The problems are similar to Photoshop, a bit better though. I can now go to retouching, click the one-to-one -one magnification and find the problematic area. Then in the list on the right, I find the original image that has the area sharp and brush the original image over the render. That helped a bit, but not all that much. But as I said, let's try the next rendering method, because it is so fast. Again we see the progress in the background, but you could even turn that progress off in the preferences to gain another 30% speed. Beside the speed, you can even create batches in Helicon and in my favorite tool, Serene Stacker, that I will introduce you to in a minute. That would render several stacks while you can go and have a nap. Photoshop can't do that. Okay, rendering method C is long finished. Let's have a closer look. It's better, but still not perfect. One has more contrast, the other one is a bit better in regard to the stacking result. That is totally normal. Another thing we could do is combine the two stacking results. Let me just export the two results by clicking File, Save All, and create a new folder to put them into. And then I click this Open Images as New Stack button, Import the two images that I just rendered and render them together using method A. That just takes a few seconds. Not sure if you see that in the video, but there is a bit of brightness difference up here. I can now go to the retouching tab and paint one of the stacking results over the other. So it's pretty straightforward and much better than Photoshop. But I won't spend too much time editing here, because the editing king, and therefore my favorite stacking program, is the next one, Serene Stacker. Serene Stacker offers a 30-day trial, so everyone can follow me. First I'll import my images with Command or Control O, select all the images, and then I click Open. Just like with Helicon, everyone recommends trying both rendering methods, so I go to Stack, Align and stack all, both. For most of my Super Macro Insect Focus stacks that we will talk about in a few seconds, usually Pmax works better for me, despite others liking Dmat more, so I have started skipping the second method. But for the sake of completeness, we will do both. In the background, you already see the focus stacking process working. Serene Stacker is definitely slower than Helicon, but the result, plus the better and faster editing process, will make up for that. Either way, I'll save you the wait. The first stack with the PMAX method took 3 minutes and 10 seconds. Still much faster than Photoshop. The second method, DMAP, is still in progress. Just a quick side note. The image looks a bit pale at the moment. That's because the TIFFs are exported in the ProPhoto RGB color space. Some programs won't display that. You've probably seen that with other apps. But once you save the finished stacks, it will look perfect. Other than PMAX, 
DMAP needs your input at one time to tell it what areas in your image you want it to care for and which can be blurry. Therefore, you have to use this contrast threshold slider. Black means you don't care about it. I'll set it to somewhere here. Then again, fast forward. After 2 minutes and 8 seconds, the second focus stacking method is finished too. So both stacks together are still a lot faster than Photoshop. And in Photoshop, you don't have the chance to choose a different render setting. Let me just export the final results so that we can compare the stacking result to Photoshop and Helicon Focus before I show you how amazing the editing works. I shift click both outputs and go to File, Save Output Images, save them as 16-bit TIFF, and choose the output folder that I already created. Now to the comparison. What I immediately see is that I crop too much in Lightroom. Watch a beginner mistake. So before we start, let me just quickly show you a correct version stacked with Serene Stacker. Anyway, first Photoshop. Let me zoom in on the problematic area. Then Serene Pmax. Can you see the difference? And as I said, Photoshop actually did a comparatively good job on that one. Usually it's a lot worse. Serene DMAP, as I already said, usually doesn't keep up with its Pmax method even though the contrast and colors look a bit nicer. And now let's compare the best output from Serene Stacker to the best output from Helicon Focus, which is C method in this case, at least for me. Also not bad. For Helicon users, I know you can fine tune the settings and trust me I did, this was the best output. So from the initial stacking result, they are rather similar in this case. But let me show you some more, yet unedited, but focus stack comparison shots so that you can make up your mind in case you're on the fence of getting either. Here are close-ups of the stacks from the Sundew we discussed earlier. Look at this overlapping area here. Photoshop, Serene Pmax, Serene DMAP, Helicon C, Helicon A. While not being perfect, the Serene stacks give me the best base for an edit. Even though, surprisingly, the Photoshop stack performs really well up here in the tentacles. Another one. Again, let's start with Photoshop. Watch the area of the hair over the eyes and the tentacle on top during the comparison. Unfortunately, I had a mite running around on that dead bumblebee that I also found under our flowers. That's those white spots that are rendered totally different from either software. So first Photoshop. Then Serene Pmax, Serene DMAP, Helicon C method, and Helicon A method. You might think this time Serene DMAP is the winner, but let me show you the other tentacle. First again Photoshop, Serene Pmax, Serene DMAP, Helicon C, Helicon A. So you already see how beneficial it would be to combine different outputs into one. And this is where Serene outperforms the others. And that's what I want to show you. I will choose the image of a bumblebee shot with a 5 to 1 magnification. First you want to choose the better output image in the lower left window. So either DMAP or PMAX. For better demonstration, I will use the DMAP. And then I go to Edit, Start Retouching. That way, in the right window, Serene Stacker will use the chosen output as the base image you're working on. I call that base from now on. In the left window, Serene Stacker will show the source you're cloning from. Think of it as the clone stamp in Photoshop, just that your source is not within the same image, but from the image that is shown to the left here. That's why I call it source from now on. So we have base and source. Once you're in edit mode, clicking on any of the images in the two left windows will set it as source. A good idea is to first set the other output image that you didn't like as much as your first source. Usually, either of the two stacking methods has better areas and worse areas, so combining them, stamping one over the other, is a quick and easy method. So let's edit a bit. Rolling the mouse wheel will change the brush size. Pressing the spacebar and rolling the mouse wheel lets you zoom in and out. The two windows will automatically be synchronized. Pressing the spacebar, clicking and dragging will let you navigate through the image. Pressing the S key will flash between the base and the source. That way you can quickly see whether stamping would have a positive effect on the edit or not. And then you can start painting. 
Let me quickly stamp the better part of the other output image on top here over the base image. And then maybe the hair over the eye that got lost. And maybe the hair on the right too. But the really good stuff is yet to come. Let me change to our sundew shot to show you why Serene is my tool of choice. I'll select DMAP as my base image and click Edit Start Retouching. As you can see, per default, one of the input images, so the original TIFFs, is selected as a source. So I can either select one of the output images, that could even be more than the two, or one of the input files as my source. And now to the best tool in Serene Stacker, the Shift key. When I hold the Shift key, an arrow will appear over the source image. If you now click with your mouse and drag up or down, you will scroll through the original images to quickly find the one you want to use as source for the stamp. This is a tremendous time saver. You've seen how difficult it was to find the right layer in Photoshop. Also in Helicon, we had to manually choose one image after the other to check which one we want to use as a new source. In Serene Stacker, shift clicking and dragging takes out that guesswork. So I can easily search for the layer that helps me improve the overlapping tentacles here. Again, pressing S on the keyboard, S for source, will show me whether it is the right image or perhaps I need to find another one. Let me fast forward so that you can watch the process. Using the shift key, I select the right image, then I stamp, then I use the shift key again, stamp again, and so on and so forth. And you can even combine these tools in case you want to maximize the base image to make more room for editing. So I hit S to view the original image and then shift and drag with a clicked mouse to find the image for my stamp source. And then I stamp my source over the base. Pretty convenient, right? While you watch me editing, let me give you some more info. Remember what I said about 16-bit TIFFs? You see that after selecting a new source, there is that rotating ball that tells me that Serene Stacker loads the new image. That takes longer, the bigger the file size. For 8-bit LZW compressed files, that's around two and a half seconds. For 16-bit uncompressed files, that is more than six seconds. And waiting six seconds after every change of the source image is pretty annoying. And since I couldn't see any difference when I later edited the final output in Photoshop, I export 8-bit LZW from Lightroom. This editing process of course takes time, usually more time than stacking, and since Serene Stacker makes this long process comparatively easy, it's my new tool of choice. Once you're finished, you first have to save the edits by clicking Edit Commit Retouching. That will take a while, so let me fast forward. Then you can save your complete project by clicking File, Save Project. And here is something important. On a Mac, that would create a humongous folder with caged source images. What you need to do to avoid that, I checked back with Rick from Serene Stacker, a tremendously helpful person, is going to the Options menu, Preferences, and under Preprocessing, make sure Use External TIFF Reader is unchecked. That is checked by default due to older Macs having issues. Rick said he will change the default at a future firmware update, but for now, make sure this is turned off. Once the project is saved, you want to save the output files. You can select them individually or shift-click them all and go to File, Save Output Image. The outputs I usually save as 16-bit TIFF LZW compressed. This checkbox here is interesting for people who feel that particularly the PMAX output has too much contrast. Checking the box Retain Extended Dynamic Range will save an image with less contrast and more dynamic range, so that you can then fine-tune it later in Photoshop. There are a few more sophisticated editing strategies for Serene Stacker, but this video is too long already, so let me know in the comments if you're interested and I'll make a separate video. Before I get into Photoshop, chances are that if you watched this far, you appreciate the work that I put into it and I realized that you didn't click the like button yet. By doing so, you would help me climb the search results, with it gain more views and followers, and that will help me gain more ad revenue. Why should that bother you? Well, you are watching this for free while I invested a lot of time and money into this. So I hope you're fair to me and hit the like and subscribe button. And while you're at it, 
don't forget to set the notification bell to all to get notified about new videos like this. Now to Photoshop. Insects and flowers are usually not all that clean. I don't clean them like others do because I usually photograph live insects. So to get to the final images, I will do some cleaning in Photoshop. Let me do that on the example of the bumblebee shot. First I create a duplicate of the layer. I hit Ctrl or Command J, but I'm honestly not sure if that's a standard shortcut for Photoshop or if I defined it myself. So instead you can also go to Layer, Duplicate Layer and give it a name if you want. You may be surprised, but I mostly don't use the clone stamp, except for very complicated areas. I also don't use the spot healing brush tool. What I use instead is the patch tool and content aware fill. That's much quicker and I personally don't see a difference in the results. So let me show you how I do my retouching. First I'll take care of the small dust particles, pollens and other things in the fur of a beautiful lion-like bumblebee. So I hit the J key on the keyboard for the patch tool and then I make a selection of the area that I want to retouch. You could of course also use the lasso tool, but since I change regularly from patching to content aware fill, it is quicker to use the patch tool. Usually I will then just hit the F1 key on my keyboard and the area is corrected within a fraction of a second. F1 for you wouldn't do anything though, because I have programmed a Photoshop action. For the next particle, I'll bring you behind the curtains of my action. First I make my selection again. Now I go to Edit, Fill. Under Contents I choose Content Aware and the rest stays at its default values. Color Adaption checked, Blend Mode Normal, Opacity 100%. Then I hit Enter and the dust particle is gone. But going through the menu for every single issue I want to retouch would be pretty cumbersome, so I program the Photoshop action and assign it to my F1 button. Now I can super quickly remove the issues. Yes, at some occasions I could use the clone stamp tool to fine tune, but I honestly don't care much. Just to show you the speed, let me do a few more pollen before I fast forward to the intermediate result. I'll even remove this hair here with this technique. Or let me show you something even cooler. What about removing some issues in the more tricky parts on the eye? Select F1, gone. Select F1, gone. Select F1, gone. Select F1, gone. I'd say that's a decent relation of time versus result. If you like the technique and would want me to make a tutorial for the Photoshop action that is also useful for non-macro images, let me know in the comments. Fast forward, the dust particles are gone. It took me exactly 4 minutes and 22 seconds to get from this image to that image. No doubt you can improve that, but it's definitely a good starter for those of you who are not familiar with Photoshop. Okay, now to the stacking worms here. For your info, stacking worms are the result of sensor dust. I probably should clean my sensor. I have a video about sensor cleaning in case you're interested. Maybe I should watch it more often too. I could use the same technique as before, but in areas with gradients, that doesn't always perfectly work. What works better is just using the patch tool. And since I have it selected anyway, I just look for an area that has roughly the same gradient, drag the selection over and release the mouse button. Then I click outside the selection to unselect and you see it worked really well. Let me fast forward again to remove the other stacking worms. What we have left in this image is a bit of a halo up on top. Let's see if we can patch that too. What is important when patching is trying to find an area that is rather similar. Down here I see that the edge from brown to black is pretty similar, so I'll drag the selection down here, align it roughly and release. Sometimes it's not perfect and requires a smaller second patch, and now it is perfect. Now let's have a look at the before and the after by hiding the layer we edited on. I'd say that is quite a difference, I hope you like it just as much. 
What I now want to do is sharpen it in Topaz Sharpen AI. I use that for all of my insect macros because it adds that little extra, even though they are sharp already. I first make a copy of the edited layer and then I go to Filter, Topaz Labs, Topaz Sharpen AI. Then weirdly, what usually gives me the best results is the preset Motion Blur Very Blurry. I hit Apply and Topaz Sharpen AI will not only add a really nice sharpening effect to the image, but also remove the noise. Let's zoom in. Here is the before and the after. I highly recommend Topaz Sharpen AI. And if you want, I even have a discount code of 15% for you down in the description. They also have a trial version, so you definitely have to try it. And that's it. Here is the final result again. And here are some more focus stacks, all stacked and edited with the techniques I showed you before. I owe you the link to the focus stacking cheat sheet and to the calculator. The cheat sheet can be found on exposure-triangle.com. If you have any tips for the cheat sheet, let me know. It's a work in progress, so I'll happily include your ideas. The macro calculator at extreme-macro.co.uk. I'll give you the links to both in the description. Thanks for watching. See you soon.